On today's show, we visit the Alaska Sea Life Center. Welcome to another great episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Katie. And I'm Drew. Today we're back in Alaska visiting the Alaska Sea Life Center. That's right, Drew. We're going to be learning all about the efforts by the center to aid in the rehabilitation and even release of some of their animals. From seals to sea lions and then to baby walruses, we're going to get an up-close look at some of the different creatures the Sea Life Center has to offer. I'm so excited. Let's go. We're here with Tim at the Alaska Sea Life Center, who is one of the stranding coordinators. And today we're going to get to work with some marine mammals who are currently being rehabilitated. But first, we have to prepare some food. So, what do we do? Right on. So, uh, we have 11 patients back in the back holding area. All of them are ready to be released. And we're just kind of getting them up to their current release weight um, so that we can put them back into the wild. Mm -hmm. So, they've already shown that they can actually forage on live fish, and we'll show you some of that. But we have to prepare their diet and we we're gonna right. get to give them vitamins. Um, so we're looking at our chart here, and we're actually gonna go ahead and feed the ODL-5 animals, which is our large pool, our graduation pool. And so we need 2,800 grams. So wow. I'll let you guys actually feed. We're feeding herring today. Um, these guys in the wild will eat herring, salmon, capelin, sometimes they'll actually eat squid. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll go ahead and uh, if you guys wanna Get your hands dirty and uh, pull out some fish and we'll take it up to 2800 and then we'll go back and uh, feed these guys. All right. All right. Ooh. So we just, how much are we looking for? Yeah, we're going up to uh, 2880 grams. Okay. Ugh. So what these guys are actually being fed is a percentage of their body weight. Um, so we're trying to get them up to a certain body weight so that they can actually go back out into the wild. Um, they started eating live fish originally, and then we transitioned them onto this fish. And this is actually, um, it's restaurant quality food. We, uh, we pull it out each day and thaw it, and then we'll uh, stick some vitamins in it so that they can actually get that little bit of added nutrition that they aren't getting from the frozen fish or that it loses during the frozen fish uh, or frozen process. And, um, and then we'll just kind of toss it in there and you'll get to see how they do back there. So is that close enough? Yeah, that looks great. We'll go ahead and we'll record that number. But first, we want to throw some vitamins in there. And so you can take each, uh, each grab a vitamin. And then I'll show you. And then you want to grab one fish. And then you want to open up its gills here. And you just want to slide it in the gills. Oh, this is yummy. All right, guys. So like we were saying that uh, we try to make sure that these animals don't become associated with humans. So on the other side of this fence is those five seals that we're gonna, we just prepared their meal. And the way that we actually feed them is that we put them through what we call these fish cannons. And these pipes actually go into the pool and the fish just get shot into the pool. That way they don't see us actually handing them the fish. And is that because you said they're in a graduation pool so they're almost ready to be released back into the wild? Absolutely. So these guys are just weeks away from going wow. back to the original place that they actually came from. Nice. Um, so um, they're, they're getting there. All they need is their fish. and. Uh, they're going to be uh, off and out of here in just a few weeks. And they'll all be released together? Absolutely. So these guys all came from the same area. So we've been actually housing them together. And then we will actually go out and release, the, release them back into that same area. Cool. All right. So these are the actual fish cannons. And what we'll do is we'll put the fish in through one of these three pipes, and they'll just get shot right into the pool. So whenever you're ready, you can just kind of take a fish, fish at a time and start putting them into the pipes. <laughs> that is crazy. How often do you feed these guys? These guys are actually fed four times a day. Okay. 
Will they eat 10% of their body weight in the wild? Well, they, they will, and they will eat throughout the entire day. So right now we're just feeding them kind of randomly. Mm. Um, so, and that's about what they will continue to eat. Now they'll have a different bit of a diet, and sometimes we'll actually mix up their diet. So even though we're feeding them herring today, maybe tomorrow we'll feed them salmon or sometimes capelin. Why did these seals come to the center? All these guys were actually orphaned, and we're never really sure why the animals were actually orphaned or how they got separated, but we just know that we found an animal or somebody called in an animal that was sitting on the beach and it wasn't with its mom. We did, we watched it for 24 hours to make sure because we know that in the wild, mom will go off and forage for 24 hours and leave their pup on the beach. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't picking up that seal when mom was just around the corner. So actually, after we watched that animal for 24 hours, and or once they sent us pictures and we saw those pictures and thought, okay, that animal doesn't look good, we need to go ahead and pick that up, then we made that decision to pick it up. So is there any way to track these animals once you release them into the wild? There is. Actually, we will uh, glue these tags onto their fur. Oh. And these tags are actually specially designed for marine mammals and actually for seals. Cool. And the reason why we glue them onto the fur is that we know these animals will molt on a yearly basis and they'll molt next June. So when we release them, we'll actually program this tag so that it will turn on, turn off to save the battery life so that we can get as much information until the tag actually falls off. Drew, don't you want to be fed out of a fish cannon now? Yes. Yes, I do. Right. But actually, those cannons were a very cool invention to ensure that the animals in the graduation pool don't associate humans with food. That's right. I also thought it was neat that the center is able to track the seals once they are released back into the wild. Well, don't go away, because when we return, we get the opportunity to meet some stellar sea lions. Aqua Kids honors aqua heroes, people working hard to keep the planet green and blue. We're not the only ones to consider Jean Beasley a hero. In 2007, she was named Animal Planet's Hero of the Year. Miss Beasley is the executive director of the Karen Beasley Sea Turtle Hospital, named after her daughter. The facility helps rescue and care for sick and injured endangered sea turtles, and eventually releases them back into the wild. The Pebble Partnership wants us to believe their plans for Pebble are unprecedented. But the Pebble process is the problem. You see, there are no standards in Alaska's mine permitting process. Nope, international mining companies could dig up 50 feet of salmon streams, or 50 miles. That's wrong. It's time for an independent review of the pebble permitting process. That's as clear as the waters of Bristol Bay. Alaska, Alaska. Before we get back to the show, we're out here in the Kenai Fjord area where there are wild stellar sea lions. And hooked up back there is a video camera that transmits back to the Sea Life Center where they monitor the wild populations. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. We're headed back to the Alaska Sea Life Center where Clark and Drew get to meet with some of the center's stellar sea lions. We're here with Brett, the husbandry director at the Alaska Sea Life Center. We're here, we're going to meet a stellar sea lion. I hear they're endangered species. How many are there left in the wild? Well, I'm not sure the number that are left in the wild, but over the course of the last 30 years, stellar sea lion populations in this region have decreased by as much as 90%. Why is that? Um, we don't know right now. There's a lot of science, scientific study going on to try to evaluate why stellar sea lions declined, and equally as important, why they're not recovering at the rate you would expect them to. Where are stellar sea lions found? Stellar sea lions range from central California all the way up the Pacific, through Alaska around to Russia and Japan. Why are the stellar sea lions at the Alaska Sea Life Center? Well, the stellar sea lions at the Alaska Sea Life Center are part of a research program that's looking at reproductive physiology in sea lions. So what are they doing now? Well, in order to make stellar sea lions, or in particular this stellar sea lion, a good research participant, we first have to work with the animal and learn how to take care of it and have that animal learn how to let us take care of it. And so currently, Maria is working with Sugar. She's our 19-year-old female, and doing different trained behaviors that allow us to take better care of her. So Sugar is conditioned to show different body parts so that on a daily basis, she can work with her trainers and we can make sure that she's healthy. So are we giving her a checkup now? We are. This is part of Sugar's daily routine. So Maria is looking at her mouth. She's going to ask her to open her mouth, make sure that her teeth look good. Uh, go through all our different body parts to make sure she doesn't have any cuts or scratches that any need medication or antibiotics, that kind of thing. 
One of the behaviors that we train the EC lions to participate in for the data collection is a behavior that allows us to use an ultrasound machine to either look at blubber thickness, so we know how much fat is on the sea lion, or if they're pregnant, it would allow us to track the fetus or to track the, the growth of the young pup. Okay, is this a routine process? How many times a year do you usually try to ultrasound? Is, this, this is a very routine process. Uh, it depends on whether they're pregnant or not as to the frequency or how often we work with her on this behavior. So I can imagine it could be pretty difficult to get some of these procedures done on the sea lions. What's one of the ways that you can maybe make it more comfortable for them? So one of the things that we can do is Tasu is trained to be voluntarily anesthetized. So she's going to come in here with Maria and Maria is going to bring her around and she's going to be putting her face into the traffic cone and what we would do is we would have the anesthesia machine hooked up to the traffic cone and give her the anesthesia gas so she just has to put her nose in the cone and then take a few breaths and she'll go to sleep while we collect valuable data for the research. And what is some of that data that you're trying to record? So what, what we'll do during the voluntary anesthesia is we'll take blood, we'll take measurements on the animals like their length, their girth, um, we can take a vaginal swab to look at estrus. Um, we can get a fecal sample if they haven't deposited one naturally recently. And we can just generally get um, an overall good look at them, take a blubber depth ultrasound if we need to, to look at their body condition. Okay. Having sea lions that are cooperatively working with their trainers and researchers allows us to start to answer questions as to why stellar sea lions aren't recovering as fast as we would expect them to in the wild. This type of work can't be done when you're working out on haul-outs and rookeries with sea lions, and so we do it on the collection animals here at the Sea Life Center. Kind of eats like you, Drew. Swallowed it whole. One of the ways to monitor the health and hormone level of the sea lions is to check the scat or poop. And since Katie doesn't even pick up her own dog's poop, we're going to make her pick up the sea lion poop. Let's go see how she does. Okay, Katie, you're going to go out in the enclosure and collect a fecal sample that one of the sea lions <laughs> left on the deck. That's There's so two ways for you to do this. Okay. okay. One way is that you can put these gloves on and go and scrape it up and put it in the bag, but then you have to clean it off with a little spatula. Or you can just put the gloves on and turn the bag inside out and pick it up. And that's easier, but it's your choice. Jeez, do I have to? It's all science. Not worth it. Mm. Here we are. <laughs> so gross. <laughs> there you go, you almost got it. Ew, ew, ew. Ew, 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 ew. All right. Now just make sure you get that bag closed real well so oh that the staple is maintained. Oh my god, it's the <laughs> Okay, okay. Okay, now you gotta get the air out of it, so make sure there's a little bit open and then just squeeze it to get all the air out. I have to squeeze the poop? Mm-hmm. Just close the bag almost the whole way and then squeeze the bag to get all the air out. So we don't want the air to ruin the sample. And now you can zip up that bag nice and tight. Good job. Hey, Katie, how'd you like picking up that poop? <laughs> Honestly, that was one of the most disgusting things I've ever had to do. But come on, Katie, it's all for science. Well, I, I guess, but I'm definitely not doing that one again. When we come back, Katie and Rachel get the unforgettable experience of feeding a baby walrus. Alaska, Alaska. Aqua Kids. Now we're headed to the quarantine area of the Alaska Sea Life Center to get an up close and personal experience with a newly orphaned baby walrus. <laughs> I cannot wait. Let's go. I'm here with Dr. Carey and a walrus that is just a few months old. It was rescued off the coast of Barrow, Alaska. Can you tell me how you found this walrus and why you decided it needed to be taken in? Well, folks had actually been keeping an eye on this guy for a couple of days, and um, this was following having seen a bunch of walrus, um, having passed by the city about the, uh, a few days ahead of time. Right. And 
they realized that he was by himself and that uh, adult, cat, uh, adult walrus hadn't been coming back and giving him the opportunity to nurse. Right. So they contacted their Department of Wildlife and they contacted both us and, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And after assessing the animal and the situation, we realized that he was by himself and he needed, if he were to survive, he, he needed some care. And the decision was made to bring him here. Okay. And uh, a walrus, once you take it in, cannot be put back in the wild at this age, right? Right. A walrus calf needs a lot of attention from, from its mom for a long period of time to not only provide it food to grow, but also to teach it the skills to survive in the wild. And the maternal period is one to two years. Okay. Because it takes a lot of care, you kind of have to develop that, that bond with the animal. And so they become a poor candidate for release and are indeed considered non-releasable. I'm here with Ramey and JR, who both got the amazing opportunity to bottle feed the baby walrus. Both being from Barrow, Alaska, can you tell me what this experience meant to you? I mean, you have walrus right in your backyard. Yeah, this was a really great experience because we don't, we see the walruses, but we don't actually get to like bottle feed them. So it was a really great experience for me. And I'm pretty sure it was a great experience for him too. I mean, having that close up encounter, what did that mean for you? Uh, it was pretty awesome. I really only seen uh, walruses dead, I mean like for food. Mm -hmm. I've never seen them alive before. <laughs> it must be pretty cool. Far away. <laughs> that baby walrus was too cute. It was so fat and lovey-dovey. It was really adorable. Hopefully he'll grow up well in the Alaska Sea Life Center. But there were other babies at the Sea Life Center as well. Let's go check in with Rachel and see what she's looking at. So Brett, we have a harbor seal pup with us. Can you tell me how old he is? Sure, Kobuk is just over four weeks old. And how old is the mother? Um, Addie is eight. And is this her first pup? No, it's actually her second. She had a, her first pup was last year, Cordelia. So we have a year old female. And then Kobach was born last month. And how long will he have to stay with his mother in this type of area? Oh, well, he's been back here since he was born. And, and we will be moving him out into another enclosure in the next day or two, because it's time to wean. One of the amazing creatures at the Alaska Sea Life Center is Woody an adult male stellar sea lion. So tell me more about him. Well, Woody is a 19-year-old male stellar sea lion, and he's been at the center since 1998. Wow. And so he is a part of our breeding program, and really the only role that Woody has right now is to become a father. He's a big one. He is. Woody weighs about 1,800 pounds right now, which is actually pretty small for Woody, believe it or not. How big do they get? Well, male stellar sea lions, fluctuate between about 1,700 pounds and 2,500 pounds every year. So Woody bulks up over winter, and right before breeding season, he is a big boy, isn't he? Wow. He's about 10 feet long. Again, full grown, territory defending male. Is this one you would see out in the wild? Well, Woody, no, but yes, this is the same size of a, of a male that you would see in the wild that was territory defending. Just like our female sea lions, Woody has cooperative behaviors that allow us to take better care of him. And so because of his size, we choose to work with Woody in protective contact, which means that he's always inside his enclosure and we're always outside of his enclosure. That's just a safer place to be. At 2,000 pounds, if he rolled over on you, it probably wouldn't be a good day. Woody's eating about 40 pounds of fish a day. That range is anywhere from about 25 pounds all the way up to 80 or 90. Depending on time of year. Huh. Don't go away. Aqua Kids will be right back. <laughs> Aqua Kids presents Aqua News. Here's our top story. Effects of Arctic sea ice loss on walrus behavior. 
Recently, the United States Geological Survey and Russian scientists have determined that over the past five years, the declining surface area of Arctic sea ice has caused the Pacific walruses to change some of their behaviors. Because the ice has begun to melt earlier in the summer, the walruses have started to arrive earlier to their feeding grounds. By the fall, when the ice had completely melted, the walruses began to forage for food closer to the shore in very large numbers. While it is too early to determine the long-term effects of these behavioral changes, it has been concluded that foraging closer to shore requires more energy from the walrus and has also led to higher infant mortality rates. With such a large group of walruses fighting for the little land space, young walruses can literally be trampled to death. With the first ice-free summer estimated as soon as 2025, we are hopeful that walruses can acclimate in time. I'm Katie from Aqua News, keeping you connected to our planet. Now, back to Aqua Kids. Well, we're out of time for today's episode of Aqua Kids, but it was a great day at the Alaska Sea Life Center. It really was. It was great to see all the efforts that the center was taking to rehabilitate the seals and take care of orphan walruses. Definitely, and although I had to pick up poop, it was great to see that research was being done in order to gain new insight in order to protect these animals. Of course. It's also important to note all of the hard work that the staff at the Alaska Sea Life Center puts in every single day to make sure that these animals survive and for some, make it back out into the wild. And that's why everyone should remember to do their part to keep this planet green and blue. And so can you. So visit our website for cool eco tips. And fun links to show you how to keep the world and the water a great place to play and explore. And we'll see you next time on, on Aqua, Aqua Kids. Kids. Furniture for the Aqua Kids set provided by IKEA.